Volk, depending on where you where you come from. Uh, really nice to have you here. You're going to be telling us a little bit about what you're going to be presenting at the Resonance uh, Conference uh, at Mistech in, in August. Um, I thought I'd start off by asking you, what, what's your background so that Andrew invited you to this uh, conference? What, what, yeah, what, what have you been doing in your past? Uh, getting to the present, and it's a very long, arduous <laughs> trip, but I think I'll get there one of these days. For the past, uh, let's see, mid-80s, 40 years, 40 years, I've been publishing material related to cymatics. Uh, originally, some of the films that Han Jenny shot in 16 millimeter, I transferred them to VHS and created programming on uh, therapeutic use of sound and backed up by cymatics. Um, in case your listening audience does not know, Cymatics is a study of wave phenomena and vibration. So it would be very akin to sound healing, as we like to call it these days. I don't call it that, but it's the current name. Um, and also to many aspects of physics, uh, many aspects of design and harmonics and of geometrical design, because the study of vibration is implicitly linked to resonance which is implicitly linked to geometry and uh, and harmonic ratios. So this is all very, very much tied together. So somatics, it's a fascinating, a really fascinating subject. I remember reading uh, Thomas Schwenk's book uh, oh, yeah. back in the 90s, Sensitive Chaos and Being. Sensitive Chaos, Theodore Schwenk, yeah. yeah. Uh, Theodore, so correct, yeah. thank you for correcting me, and really being taken away by it. So this the visualization and then somatics is taking obviously that to a completely different level. The difference um, between the two of them was um, Schwenk basically used uh, morphological form, prototypic forms to show basic types of nature or mm -hmm. basic types within natural forms. And Yeni wrote a book on that too, prior to cymatics called Der Typus, the type. Mm -hmm. where in morphological types. So they were very much aware of each other's work, or at least Yenny was aware of his work anyway. Um, yeah. I don't really remember how the timing goes, but I believe that Yenny died before Schwenk. Okay, right. So um, the, if, I, if I say as a complete amateur that you're working with the formative forces, the etheric forces, uh, it's like a, a, it's a it's a means of visualizing what's theorized by Steiner, but we're, we're, you're making it you're, you're bringing it right into the uh, material realm where you've got full control over it. Right. That's a, that's a very good distinction because Steiner's work is very difficult for people to understand. You need the, you need to have the uh, vocabulary to understand it, and then you need to be able to move into a world where you're not dependent on definition of form as a sensory experience. It becomes an, a trans-sensory experience in terms of not our normal waking senses. Um, I think we can get way, way off track on this. So I think okay. the, the, the way I'd like to put it is going back to Schwenk again. Mm -hmm. Schwenk showed was basic, mor basic morphologies found throughout nature. And what, what Yeni was able to do, which made it so, so fundamental to things like therapeutic use of sound, is he was able to use audible sound frequencies. And that's very important. They're audible. They're not mm -hmm. things that are way outside of the audible range. These are things like you could use your voice. You could use bird chips and cricket chirps and whatever. And you could see an organic form usually with geometrical symmetry, but not always, but with mm -hmm. a great degree of organization, they would show up for you right as you're listening to them. So this was phenomenal. You could actually see the world of sound. And up until this point, that was not the case. So it's, it's, it's a new form of synesthesia, almost. Yes, one with no side effects. Yeah. <laughs> expansion of consciousness. So you're going to be presenting at this conference. So you're you're heavily involved. Uh, not quite sure. Uh, 
tell us about uh, what it is that you might be presenting or that you are presenting. Well, we'll know when I get there um, because it will be the first question I usually pose on the audience is who knows anything about cymatics whatsoever? Or if I know that there are a sophisticated audience in this regard, um, I will just say, well, how much experience do you have with it or what do you know about cymatics? And wait for a little bit of feedback because you know, I can start at a very fundamental level, which is where I would start this interview, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. It's basically the, the subject cymatics is a study of wave phenomena and vibration, very basic. So it can be seen as a, as a part of physics. The beauty of cymatics is that it helps us to find, well, let me not go there. That's even more complex. See, when you ask me, what am I going to talk about? I usually approach this more poetically than scientifically, because I find that it can get very confusing and very heady if you approach it from an abstract point of view and a lot more immediately visceral if you can ju just watch a couple of films. Because the films show you live and in motion exactly what is happening in real time. They show you that geometrical harmonic forms can take place as a result of resonance. And that's what this conference is all about, is resonance. So if you can show a way of articulating resonance, measuring resonance, altering resonance, then you can begin to have a tie-in to a more abstract field, the abstract field in which we actually occupy space and time. So, and I said that very specifically, because just because we occupy space and time doesn't mean we are space and time or that we're even necessarily always subject to space and time. And I feel that when you can begin to move beyond that imprisoning state of consciousness, which we're born into, mm -hmm. that's part of our, our hardware, and well, our software more likely, it is part of the programming that we come into the world with because it enables us to survive. It also entraps us at a level of survival, which is very primitive. Uh, it doesn't inherently make us primitive, but it biologically keeps us in a certain range, a certain bandwidth, that when you operate outside of that bandwidth, people begin to think you're a little weird. But yeah. people who can function at that level realize that that is the bandwidth that we want to naturally uh, resonate with because it gives us the most amount of freedom. It gives us the capability of interpretation it gives us the capability of choice in a matter instead of reflex, reflexive thinking. So it's a very empowering metaphor for the potential of what we are as human beings. Cymatics, I like to call a living metaphor because it shows us how the world works in a, in a field in which you normally cannot see any of it, which is sound. Can, can I ask a question there? Because you actually mentioned one that's like a very practical application that's when you uh, something you mentioned a couple of minutes ago, which was actually it was new to me, this idea of using it therapeutically. And uh, not that sound can't be used therapeutically. I mean, people just listen to music, but I, I get the sense that you're talking about in a the use of uh the use of sound in a far more scientific way as a curative uh means it, did i did i pick up on something there or am i imagining you picked up on something that would probably get you in trouble with the fda <laughs> <laughs> so they're actually they, they, they can't they can't touch me here it's okay <laughs> <laughs> well quite honestly um within the last year the um american uh, Let's see if I can remember their names. So there are the um, NEA, National Institutes of Art, NIA, National Institutes, the National Institutes of Health and the Institutes of Art. I forget that, I forget that one. So you got the NEH and the, um, and I having to do with the arts and performance and musical, um, you know, this is not 
my normal shtick. So it's going to take me a couple of minutes to pull this up. She's a very famous, Renee Fleming, famous mm -hmm. opera singer, is a very big player in the National Institutes of Health, co-sponsored with the National um, Artists um, Association, which is not what it's called. This is a federal program that's mm -hmm. pouring tons of money into looking at the arts and very specifically music as a therapeutic application, a therapeutic um, function, very yeah. specifically, uh, with a lot of scientific rigor. Now, this may sound new to you, but that's been fully funded for the past year. So it means that there's been a hundred thousand years worth of work that's gone into it before the NEA ever got even word of it, no less decided to fund it. Yeah. Mm, so it, nothing new. I mean, it, it goes back to shamanic rituals. And before that, even it goes back to cave rituals where there's artistry put in the cave walls and they, they would find when they explored these, these uh, tunnels, these caverns, that the places where the largest volume of artwork was carved into the walls were the areas of greatest resonance. So clearly, there's a place in Mount Malta, isn't there? That is it called the Apogeum or something like that? The case yeah, in yeah, Malta. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, these people didn't just sort of stumble into these places. You know, they were drawn yeah. in there through their perceptivity of this enormous power and focus that was present in those places because of the echoing resonance of the chambers. And they became sacred spaces. They became places where these people would come to seek out a deeper resonance with the non-manifest, with things that did not show up to the senses, but which actually were extremely important to their way of structuring their world. Yeah. So it it's sounds... been around for a long time. It's just been suppressed by the medical association for one and many other associations that like to keep people under their thumb. So it's, it's, as I said earlier, it's a very liberating study to find out that one has the capacity to move in ways that you've never experienced before. And yeah. because we've been conditioned not to think of these things, you don't. We might have to edit this question out as well, but is DARPA involved as well? Uh, you know, anything that can be used for consciousness expansion can be used for weaponry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you do end up talking about at uh, at the conference. I, I, I would like to thank you for talking with me, Jeff. What I'd like to do is really um, give a couple of concrete interpretations or what I'm likely to speak about, so I don't come across as if I'm just going to come up there and babble, which is always an option. But um, at my best, the babbling is pretty coherent. So um, we'll try to keep it there. Mm -hmm. um, what I would like people to go away with, um, with is a deeper understanding of the potential, the creative potential of sound. And cymatics, just seeing a couple of minutes of video give you that because you see an organic form taking shape right in front of your eyes for no other reason than the sounds that are being projected into that form, into that material. So more fully, cymatics is the study of how audible sound frequencies shape, direct, and animate inert substances, such as powders, pastes, liquids, iron filings, all sorts of things that by themselves would just be sitting there. But yeah. when the resonance gets established, when you can put forth frequencies or sound pulsations in a frequency range in which the material is resonant, it will respond and it will start to create even lifelike flowing forms. And that's what blows people away more than anything. Yeah. Yeah, there are some there are some amazing videos on YouTube. I know I've I've seen it, seen them as well. Really, it is uh, breathtaking. So that was one thing you mentioned a couple a couple of things. Uh, if I um, if I remember correctly, you said yeah. one thing I might talk about, and the other thing. Yeah, well, given that this is a conference on resonance, 
I think it's important to explain different aspects of resonance because just to have a conversation, you need to have resonance. One field of resonance you need to have is called language. If you don't have the same language, you're not going to have a lot of resonance there. So I will define a few terms and I will also use different styles of expression. I like to use poetry to start off my presentations because it takes people out of this passive mindset where they just have to be sitting there listening to someone who's going to tell them something that they may or not even understand. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather engage people right from where they begin, which is curiosity, a sense of awe, a sense of beauty. You know, all of these elements that we find so prominent in our world, mostly in the natural world, if these can be approached while at the same time engaging the intellectual senses, so you get a sense of how things fit together, how the meaning of this little bit of information and this little feeling here, and perhaps a joke over there, it, yeah. it rounds out the experience in such a way that we begin to think coherently and collectively. So there is a resonance that gets established within the audience. There's a resonance between the speaker and the audience, but there's an, a resonance that happens within the room. Um, and you know a good presenter comes in and takes command of the room instantaneously if that is his or her choice. It could be that they want to come in and draw the audience into them, in which case they might start with a poem. So there are many different ways of assimilating information. And the cognitive is the smallest and most minuscule of those ways. It's sort of where you get to once you've done the hard work of penetrating your defenses. Because we don't want to know stuff that's going to disturb us. We want to know stuff that might be harmful to us, but we don't want to know it so much that when someone comes up and tells us that we're poisoning our world and we're likely to destroy it entirely, you know, that, that puts out a little bit of resistance. So <laughs> it's usually a better way to approach than yeah. with your tactic. Yeah. A pleasure talking to you, Jeff. Thanks, uh, thanks for your time. And uh, yeah, as I said, I'll, I'll look forward to following you more in uh, at the conference.